So, one more thing. I mean, four more things. Uh, before we begin. My, there are four things to keep in mind constantly when you're looking at a game, when you're examining it for its worth. And that's the visuals, the audio, the controls, and the design. All four of those things speak to each other. Only two of those things are independent of any other, and that is the visuals and the audio. You can have visuals alone, and you can have audio alone. But when you start to look at controls and design, you need visuals or audio to actually communicate those ideas. And in that sense, visuals and audio are things that you can observe on their own. So for visuals, mainly the very general terms that you look over are the graphics and the art style. And those things both compose how the game is presented to you and what it looks like. These things can be very revealing in terms of information. You can tell if a game's from 1985 or if it's from 2008 just by looking at the graphics and the art style. Um, some games, of course, it even indicates exactly what era, it doesn't indicate exactly what era it's from, it indicates what era it's trying to be from. So you'll see, even though, there, even though we live in this great age of technology where my iPhone is as powerful as a laptop was in 2002, um, you still see games that are made for these powerful processors that don't really take advantage of them. They sort of just make the retro pixel art and really easy gameplay mechanics to sort of grab that nostalgia. And so in, exa in examining graphics and art style, not only do you see what date a game can be from, but what date it wants to go for, and it sort of conveys what the game developer wants you to feel like. So that's part of design. That part becomes entangled with design. When you have something like audio, you want to look at active and passive audio. Now, these terms seem very general and very vague, but the definition of them is basically this. Active audio is something that will educate you as you play the game. Passive audio is something that reminds you of something that's going on in the game constantly. So examples of this, it seems very perplexing at first, but active audio can be the sound of your gun chamber firing. Um, it can be the sound of enemies that are yelling at each other, trying to yell coordinates and coordinate some sort of attack on you. Uh, the active involves you interacting with the game to produce an audio cue back. So. When you fire your gun, you'll hear however many shots you have left in the chamber until you have to reload. That's active. But passive is more of, it's in the background or it's constantly playing as you go. So you can think of the score in a game as being passive for much of it. Um, there are some active cues in which maybe it'll crescendo into a huge you know, score note whenever you jump off of like a cliff and land that sweet jump somewhere. Maybe shoot a guy in the face and suddenly the day is saved. Um, Passive is really just there to play in the background and remind you of your surroundings. It's the ambient noises and the constantly looping music that keep you sort of engaged in the game. Uh, let's see here. Controls. You have your basic layout and your constraints that layout presents. Um, we're not yet to the point of playing games like that movie starring Gerard Butler that was awful. Um, we can't just put a chip in our head and move our hands and it'll move whoever's on screen with us one to one. We can do a connect now, which is kind of interesting and nifty, but it doesn't do complete motion control. And so when you play a game, every game has different controls and every developer has different constraints on those controls. When you build games for a PC, you've got the full keyboard and a mouse, which is nice because you've got so many buttons. It can actually reflect how the game is played and how the developer wants you to play it. When you play a game like World of Warcraft, you can tell that Blizzard kind of wants you to get engaged in the lore and sort of learn the mechanics of the game because there's so many fucking buttons for you to use. <laughs> when you play a game like Uncharted, you can tell that Naughty Dog wants you to focus on these core mechanics of you jumping and you sort of punching people and shooting people and all of these other things that Drake can do. Drake cannot, however, pick up a book and read it because they don't want a contextually sensitive button to do that. There's no reason for them to actually have you do that in a game. So looking at the layout of controls and the constraints they present lets you know also what the game design is supposed to be, what the focus of the game is supposed to be. Um, and looking at the actual design, which is the very top level thing, you have game types and details. And the game type, there are four base game types. Um, this is something I'm developing currently for a research paper. Uh, and so I will digress for a second to talk about these game types. 
The four types are, there's sensory type, there's a sensory game design, there is a narrative game design, there's a player-driven game design, and then there's actually just a design, like a straight level design-driven design. And so in an instant, instance of this, let's see, Mega Man would be, for instance, a design-driven design. So the game itself, it sort of has, you know, you get the you get the Nintendo cartridge for like Mega Man 2. And it has a story in the manual that says Dr. Wily's done this, and then it even tells you that when you start the game up. Dr. Wily's kidnapped these eight master robots, blah blah blah, nobody cares. You jump into the game, you choose your level. The thing that pulls you through the level is the design of the level itself. You constantly want to see what's going to happen next. It's the level design that pulls you through and engrosses you. This is a design game. This is a design-driven game. And so in this sense, you can see that specific type of game. It's when the level is structured such that it's supposed to pull you through and nothing else really. I didn't really care that I was meeting eight master robots and progressing in a story. I wanted to see what was next in the level, what was creative, what they could do with it. Um, when you have a player-driven game like Skyrim or uh, Mass Effect or an RPG of that sort, it seems like it would be narrative driven because in Mass Effect the story is very heavily dependent on you know your choices and where it takes you and it's this overarching space opera. But when you boil down to it, it's really more of a player driven game because player driven games, they present you with the tools and with a narrative and sort of the gameplay mechanics that you really want to use and have fun with but the whole purpose of the game is to be who you want to be. And in that sense, you drive the game as a player. It's player driven. And so in Skyrim, when you want to be a thief, you make yourself a thief. And in Mass Effect, when you want to be the good guy, you make yourself the good guy. There are a lot of other games that focus more on narrative, and those games don't have as much of a branching sort of definition to them. So you can think of Bioshock Infinite, I'm sure, I think, it doesn't have any, it doesn't have multiple endings, I'm sure Ken Levine wanted it to have one specific one. So it's more of a narrative-driven story than it is probably a uh, player-driven. Although there is more, there are moral concepts that you have to sort of, um, moral I'm choices you one way or another. What? <laughs> I'm not saying anything. Okay, don't say one thing or another, but you, there are moral choices that you make in Bioshock. So in that sense, you can see that it's heavily narrative-driven, but it has little hints of player-driven sort of things. So. These game types aren't necessarily specific. There's not a black or white. It's this <coughs> game type definitely. There's more of a, it's heavily leaning more towards this game type. It incorporates elements of another one, but it's specifically this kind. And then the uh, last, let's see, the, the, so narrative we've already covered, player we've already covered. Um, we also covered design, but Sensory is a completely different experience. Sensory is basically when somebody wants you to take drugs without taking drugs. It's the game that focuses solely on combining audio and visual and then figuring out what it can do with gameplay mechanics to bring that sort of heightened sense of perception to you. So games like Luminous, Electronic Symphony, Child of Eden, um, a lot of other sort of like medios and, and even like mostly puzzle kind of games, but even the Xbox 360's music system, I believe, the visualizer back when it used to exist, I don't know if it still does or not, um, was a game in itself that was sensory because you could move a controller around in it and it would basically produce trippy color. <clears throat> so it's sort of trying to get as much dopamine out of you as possible. It's making you ridiculously happy and engaged using only audio and visual and these very basic mechanics that it's set for you. So these are the four elements that you keep in mind when you look through a game. And if anybody needs reference to any of this, it's sort of the details segment of design is really more of the nuanced parts of a game when you're looking at it. So in Uncharted 3, uh, when you're running as Nathan Drake down a stairwell, he'll put his hand out onto the railing to steady himself. That's a detail. That's something that a designer said, hey, I know that we're making this game where you're going to be a pretty kick-ass guy. It's kind of like Indiana Jones, you know, it's kind of awesome. And people will probably be distracted with the fact that you're fighting a bunch of guys. But it would be so awesome if we could just get him to stretch his hand out and put it on a railing. And not that many people look at that sort of detail, but that's something that they're trying to convey to you, sort of to make it more relatable and more human. That even in this game where you're focusing on 
jumping through windows and escaping burning buildings and whatever else, this guy has the time to put his hand out and grab a railing. It's just like, well, yeah, I mean, he's got to steady himself immediately. You'd think it would be one of those things that's kind of just easy to put in a game, but it's not. Something very handcrafted and specific, a signature almost, of the artist who made it, the designers who made it. 